makers and market movers. This is The Pulse with Francine Lacroix. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London with the conversations that matter. And here's what's coming up on today's program. Israel launches a strike on Iran, according to U.S. officials, but Iranian media appears to downplay the incident. Markets remain on edge after Middle East tensions escalate. Stocks in Europe head for a weekly loss as uncertainty stokes demand for haven assets. Plus, voters head to the polls in the world's biggest election with the Prime Minister Narendra Modi seeking a third term in India. So as we're saying, markets on edge this Friday morning after an escalation in tensions in the Middle East that sent actually stocks tumbling around the world and stoked demand for haven assets, including bonds and uh, the dollar. You can see European stocks are stabilizing somewhat, still a little bit under pressure. Oil actually pairing initial gains with Brent below $90. Now, WTI oil now also just trading above 1% was earlier. It was up as much as 4%. Gold also getting a bid today, 2,384. Now, gains for Treasuries drove the 10 year yield as much as 14 basis points lower. Again, some of these market moves were really tempered as Iranian media appear to downplay uh, the spiraling of tensions. The details of the escalation, frankly, are still quite murky. And you can see VIX pretty elevated at 20.36. Now, blasts have been heard in Isfahan, Iran. We understood a short while ago from the IAEA that no nuclear sites have been dam damaged in Iran. So everyone is now watching what Iran does next. That will determine probably the broader economic impact. So let's bring in Bloomberg's Paul Wallace in Dubai with the very latest. Paul, there, there was concern that Iran would do this in a very heavy-handed way. H how would you describe what we know so far and whether Iran now escalates further? Hi, Francine. Well, the facts are still pretty hazy at, at the moment, and neither the Iranian nor the Israeli government has confirmed that there was uh, an, a, a strike by Israel on Isfahan. But it appears there was an attack of some kind. At the moment, it looks as if it was far from extensive and probably below the threshold that would force Iran to react in kind to Israel um, and certainly below the threshold for something that would trigger a regional war or a war between Israel and Iran. So I think that's something that the U.S., Europe, and Arab states will very much welcome. I think it's something that we're seeing markets welcoming at the moment. As you, as you mentioned, oil uh, is, is up by less than 1 percent at the moment. Uh, Brent's below $88 a barrel. It did jump above 90 um, in, in very early trading this morning in Asia. Uh, gold did the same thing. It spiked, but it's now paid most of its gains. Uh, U.S. Treasury yields fell quite heavily, but they're now up again and almost flat on the day. So I think yep. at the moment there's a sense of calm uh, in markets. And all the, the early signals, and I, I stress it's early and we, we're still finding out all the, the facts, the early signals from Iran are that it won't react to this, that it doesn't need to, uh, and that it's uh, certainly not um, panicking uh, or expressing um, a lot of anger uh, about this, uh, as it often does when when it's attacked by Israel yeah. or, um, or, or other groups. At the moment, it's act re reacting pretty calmly. Uh, Paul, I mean, in these things, usually we watch out also to, to see what allies, for example, of Iran say. Have we heard from, from some of the big superpowers or smaller countries in the region and their reaction to the latest? Not so far. We've heard from Oman and expressed its concern about what happens, and it reiterated that the situation in the Gulf and the wider Middle East is very tense at the moment, uh, and there is a danger of, of a wider conflict. We haven't heard from the likes of Saudi Arabia or the UAE yet, and there's been no official comment from uh, the big Western powers, the likes of the US or, or France or Germany um, or, or, or the UK so, so far, but I'm sure that will come uh, at some stage uh, today. Okay. One thing to note about Israel is that it very rarely comments on attacks linked uh, to Iran, so there is a chance that it just says absolutely uh, nothing about this, but it's, okay. it's pretty much taken as a given, given um, within Israel that Israel um, has it, 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 uh, is behind this.
Uh, Paul, thank you so much. Paul Wallace there in Dubai for us now. We're joined by Beata Manthi, uh, Global Equity Strategy at Citigroup, Global Markets, a lot going on in, in the markets, Beata. And we're also joined to talk about oil by Bloomberg's um, Will Kennedy in charge, of course, of all commodities. And here we'll, we, we focus on oil. I mean, I find it quite incredible. So oil spiked up, like gaining 4%, and it's now just above 1%. So is the market now discounting further escalation? I think it was taking uh, guard against the fact that this could have been a very big deal and it's pairing gains on the indications as Paul explained to you then that this, uh, while it is a retaliation, uh, it seems uh, from what we can tell and we don't know all the details that it is fairly uh, limited in scope. So I think the markets tend to react quite violently in the initial moments when people are trying to scramble to understand what's going on um, and then sometimes pull back when uh, the dust settles a little bit. But, but Beata, I don't know whether, it, I mean, now the market is, is it's, first of all, it's been a dismal week. So if we put it into context, I mean, it's already been a pretty bruising week for equities. We've seen risk assets go up because of Fed speak and what we heard from that inflation print. But if you put this into context, you worry that the market now, you know, dismiss this risk. And actually, we don't really know what happens next and we don't even know what happened so far. Absolutely. So geopolitics has been the main risk we've been flagging to our quite constructive view on equities going forward. We are not changing that yet, but definitely the latest escalation clouds this, uh, this, this good setup that equities have had. However, for equities to move, move meaningfully lower on the basis of what is happening in the e Middle East, we do need to see um, oil prices to push meaningfully higher, right, to, to, to have an implication. It, it, does it change on where you want to be constructive on? So if you look at some of the industries, and I know we've talked about defense in the past, but, you know, either comp people that make components for some of the things that are needed, is, is, do, do those stocks look expensive now or <coughs> is there still opportunity? Look, this is early, early moments. We do not know enough details of what is going on. But the main focus, of course, is the oil prices and it is the, um, the stock oil prices, so the oil sector that is definitely uh, not pricing in oil prices around uh, above $90, right? So this is the key focus. But it's also important to put things into perspective, right, that we are entering this volatile period with quite a bullish sentiment, euphoric sentiment as per some of our models. So our models were already suggesting and warning us that the market was ready to take profits. And of course, these models need a catalyst and geopolitics could be one of them. Well, is there an assumption, I don't know whether that's a right assumption or not, that given the, I guess, volatility of the world economy, you know, Israel, that is usually quite precise and it's striking, wouldn't touch oil facilities? Uh, I think that's probably unlikely. I think most of the risk that traders see is an escalation that actually affects shipments out of the Persian Gulf, a fifth of the world's oil from Iran, but Iraq, Saudi Arabia, UAE is coming out of the Persian Gulf. And the scenarios that traders are most worried about are that shipping's disrupted. And of course, through the Houthis, we've seen that Iran has been willing to uh, attack or mess with global shipping. So. That, I think, is the biggest risk. But, yes, I don't think that people are too worried at this stage about a direct hit on uh, oil facilities in Iran. So we don't know. I mean, to, to the, your very good point about shipping, we actually don't know where this ends up, right, in two, yeah. three days. No, no, no. I mean, there are lots of uh, scenarios, and I think traders at the end of last week were worried to see that uh, the Iranians seized a container ship, which they said would link uh, to Israel, more evidence that shipping could perhaps be drawn into this situation. I mean, is it, again, is it quite likely, the fact that the, the media are downplaying this, what does it tell us that there, there wasn't, again, that actually it wasn't a huge deal, that, you know, there was a surgical strike or, or no. that actually politically inside they can't be seen? Because that will also change the way they react with oil exports. Yeah, no, look, I think that uh, the market is clearly finding its level around $90 uh, to push meaningful higher. You're going to have to see a, a bigger excavation than we saw last night. But I would also say that the flat price doesn't tell you the whole story. One of the things that we've observed over the last two weeks is a lot of traders in the option markets taking position to protect themselves a against any escalation. So I don't think that people should be thinking the oil market isn't worried about the situation. Mm -hmm. Some of that anxiousness, some of that anxiety is not playing out in the front, front price, but elsewhere in the market. Uh, Beata, we're also in full earnings season. 
right? Which is, again, it's always a complicated time to try and figure out what these companies are telling us and, and their forward guidance. Do, do, do these geopolitics, actually tensions rising in the middle of earnings season, make it much more complicated, for example, for, you know, portfolio managers to be constructive? So it's just another catalyst for portfolio managers to, to think about and consider, right? So we are really watching fundamentals. At the end of the day, higher oil prices play uh, into the margins and into the uh, earnings, right? Too early to say, but we would like to see companies in Europe at least coming in line with the analyst expectations. There are some inflection points in the forecast, so we see earnings revisions into this reporting season that defies seasonal expectations of downgrades from the analyst. So there are some tentative signs that actually there's an inflection on the earnings and fundamental story. And of course, the, the geopolitics could cloud this, this improvement uh, in, the, in the fundamentals. So uh, we'll be but, watching for that. Uh, yeah, but I also want to ask you about hedging in some of the industries or some of the companies. But first of all, I mean, we haven't heard from OPEC Plus. I mean, would they factor this or would they take this into account? Is there enough buffer for Saudi to put extra oil if needed? I think that uh, right now that the policy making will still be driven by supply demand fundamentals um, and looking at where they think demand's going. However, I do think one of the reasons that the market reaction perhaps has not been greater, at least on the flat price, is there is an awareness that there is a spare capacity. Three million barrels a day in Saudi Arabia, perhaps a million or more in the UAE. And in extreme scenarios, that would, could be brought to bear. Okay, thank you both for joining us. Bloomberg's Senior Executive Editor for Energy and Commodities, Will Kennedy, and staying with us, Beata Manthi from Citigroup Global Markets. Now, plenty more to come. This is Bloomberg. Our top story this morning, Israel has launched a retaliatory strike on Iran following last week's missile and drone barrage from Tehran. That's according to U.S. officials, though media from both countries appear to downplay the severity of the incident. Now, still with us, Beata Manthi, global equity strategist at Citigroup Global Markets. Also joining us is Bloomberg's MLive, Nora Alali. So welcome, Nora. Thank you so much for sticking around. Uh, Beata, when you look at, I mean, first of all, we have to remind everyone that we're quite thin on details. Like, you know, we know that a strike happened because we spoke to U.S. officials, but we don't know exactly what was hit. So we're waiting for that news. We're talking about equities, and I guess there's a natural hedge that some industries would have done because the price of oil could have always gone up. I mean, does that make a difference between the industries that you like and you don't? So it makes a difference starting from the top line on the regions, right? So for us, the market, from the major markets, the market that tends to do best in this type of geopolitical flare-up, a, a bit of risk of and oil prices going up is FTSE 100. So it's the UK market. So that's the one to, to watch as a hedge uh, from the very top uh, top down perspective. And then within the sectors, of course, the market would be worried about the infrastructure mm -hmm. and supply um, chain constraints, disruptions uh, and oil prices, really. And of course, for us, within defensive sectors, it is healthcare as an ultimate uh, defensive health, uh, hedge against volatility. And, and we were saying that this also comes really, f frankly, at the end of a quite dismal trading week, right after we had the CPI and some pretty hawkish Fed uh, speak. We heard some and we saw some big moves into havens, and that's been tempered a little bit. Yeah, absolutely, because the dynamic or the backdrop is higher yields, right? So while, as you've said, you know, the tensions in the Middle East were you know, quite high into the European session. By the time we'd come in, we'd have media reports from both sides really downplay what's happened. And that's been reflected. Gold has come off the highs. Yields are creeping back higher, or at least they're pairing some of the earlier drop that we've seen earlier. Because the backdrop is higher yield, a bit more, you know, even with the improvement risk sentiment, you come into the weekend, there's a lot of uncertainties at play. And it's going to be quite uncertain for traders to close out those positions, or at least there might be some hedging involved. So if you look at oil, although it's paired some of the gains, it is still higher. And if you kind of really 
zoom out a bit in the last six months, you'll see that oil has really been trekking higher, you know, on the back of those concerns about supply, on the back of those tensions really rising. And you can see it say that, you know, as Will Kennedy was saying, really play out in the options market as well. So a lot of risks are really yeah. bottled up in the in the markets as well. And so, no, when you look, I mean, you also look at VIX. It's interesting to see, you know, what was maybe a safe haven 10 years ago is, is slightly different. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, let's take the Swiss franc for as an example. You know, it has, you know, done quite well for itself today, but the outlook for the currency is a lot more tied to the rates outlook right now. Japanese yen also, you know, there are all these intervention risks that we're talking about, particularly when you're considering things like a resurging dollar, you know, that risks to the global trade uh, tie-in. You know, you had Janet Yellen not really uh, almost... Um, listen to the concerns that have come from South Korean and Japanese officials. And really, you can see that dynamic of a strong gold dollar really hurting everything else. So those traditional havens, uh, barring gold, of course, which has really confused a lot of people, are not really playing in that same aspect. Not today, though. We are seeing some uh, return to that because yeah. where else would you go? Um, so we're just getting also some news from the Jerusalem Post. Uh, so this has not been confirmed by Bloomberg. But according to the Jerusalem Post, Israel has hit Iranian Air Force assets at Isfahan, of course, in Iran. Beata, we were, all, you know, again, it, it's been a tough week, right, for positioning, as Nora says, but also we're in the middle of earnings season. So when you look at, uh, we also in the, in the middle, or certainly in the last 10 days, there was a definite move of divergence between what the ECB does and what the U.S. does. So what does it mean for your like of European stocks? So in terms of Europe, the earnings backdrop overall for this year is weaker than in the U.S., Right, so that's number one point to make. The reporting season is going to be negative, but that has been widely expected. In the US, it's going to be a positive number. Therefore, it's easier for the, uh, for the, uh, for, to satisfy the negative bearish market expectations in Europe with some bids or coming in line than for very elevated market expectations uh, in the US. So I would point out to that. And at the end of the day, coming back to the Fed and to the ECB, it's pretty certain that the ECB is going to go ahead in June. Uh, that's the right backdrop for the European corporates. We continue to like continental Europe over the US that is, that is uh, neutral right now. But how difficult is it actually for the ECB? I mean, there's always this gravitational pull that we also were talking with Noor in the past from the Fed. So how difficult is it for the ECB to do it, you know, swimmingly without any major disruption? And does that really help European corporates? So the, the initial few cuts, even if the Fed goes the, doesn't do the same, according to our economists, are going to be an easy path. And then, of course, if the Fed, that's the risk, the Fed doesn't do anything, then perhaps ECB starts thinking uh, about further cuts uh, into the year. But overall, yes, definitely, the monetary easing helps the economy above yeah. all. And there is a 50% of revenues from the European corporate coming from the Eurozone, so definitely matters. For example, the latest upgrades that we've seen in the Eurozone, so 50 basis points higher GDP that yeah. we've upgraded, fed into 3% higher EPS. Definitely matters. Um, and and I know we're looking more at kind of like oil being range bound for the moment, but at what level or what kind of increase could that change the path forward for central banks? Well, you know, the ECB's outlook uh, earlier this year had taken into account energy prices coming down and sort of that trickle effect on CPI or, you know, the disinflation trend that we've been seeing, right? But the IMF had just come out with a report that says Saudi Arabia needs prices at around 96 a barrel for its balance sheet to be, uh, you know, uh, to be quite balanced, right? So uh, there's a lot at play. OPEC Plus has put a lid on supplies. Uh, you have seen reports of sanctions from the U.S. Uh, on Venezuela, potentially considering also more sanctions on Iran. Uh, we know that China buys a lot of the Iranian oil as well. There's, of course, also what's happening with Russia. Yeah. So really, with oil, it is a question of supply. Yeah. And the fact and it's that, always complex. Yes, actually. 100%. Noor, thank you so much. Uh, Beata Manti, they're a global equity strategy at Citigroup Global Markets and Bloomberg's MLive's Noor Ali. Now, coming up, almost 1 billion Indians begin voting in the world's biggest election, which will last more than six weeks. We discuss how the prime minister is seeking a third term in power. This is Bloomberg.
It's the largest electoral exercise in the world. 968 million adult Indians are eligible to cast a vote on five and a half million voting machines. 18 million of those would be first time voters in their teens, with a further 197 million in their 20s. 15 million polling agents will be deployed across a million polling stations in 543 constituencies. Some of these constituencies hold as many as 3 million voters. That's equivalent to the population of Jamaica. To keep the process safe, 2 million security personnel were deployed in the 2019 polls. That was also the world's most expensive election. India, with $8.7 billion spent by candidates and political parties in India. 2024's seven-phase, six-week election runs from April 19th to June 1st, with the outcome known on June 4th. Haslinda Amin, Bloomberg News. That was Haslinda reporting on India's election. Now, voters in the world's largest democracy are heading, of course, to the polls in a vote set to last six weeks. Coming up, as Iran downplays an Israeli strike on its territory, we take a look at market risks and, of course, this developing story. This is Bloomberg. Israel launches a strike on Iran, that's according to U.S. officials, but Iranian media actually appear to downplay the incident. Markets remain on edge after Middle East tensions escalate. Stocks in Europe head for a weekly loss as uncertainty stokes demand for haven assets. Plus, voters head to the polls in the world's biggest election with the Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi seeking a third term. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. So let's return to our top story, Israel's retaliatory strike on Iran. Tina Fordham, founder of Fordham Global Foresight, joins us along with Bloomberg Opinion's Mark Champion. So thank you both for joining us. Tina, I don't know whether you think this is something that will not lead to escalation or whether you worry that we just don't have the full set of facts yet, that both sides could be minimizing, but the damage could be much bigger. I think what I would conclude at this stage is that we should stay on high alert when it comes to the risk of further escalation in the Middle East. Um, there had been suggestions that Israel would wait until after Passover ends April 30th. Um, instead, we saw this strike overnight reportedly near Isfahan. I think what's important is that Israel has shown uh, Iran that it can fire and will fire inside Iranian territory, near a military air base, and that this is a warning shot. Um, and, uh, you know, the ball is now in, uh, in Iran's court. Mark, what, what do you think Iran does next? Well, I mean, if you look at the signaling on uh, television, uh, what you know, Iranian officials have been saying, they're playing it down. They're even trolling Israel. You know, uh, sending around images of, you know, quadricopter drones next to the ballistic missiles that they sent the other day. So, to me, uh, that is really the important uh, signal at the moment. Uh, as we, you said, we don't we don't really know exactly what the impact was, um, but the Iranians seem to be playing it down. That's you know a good thing. Uh, it creates some sort of optimism uh, that uh, if the Israelis leave it at this, uh, then the Iranians are also, you know, inclined to uh, try and uh, laugh it off. Whatever, whatever happened, uh, in, in inclined to sort of minimize it, um, say it was a failure, uh, and claim victory and walk away. Um, which, uh, you know, from the point of view of whether there's any further escalation, and for the rest of us, that's that's good news. Uh, we know, uh, Tina, actually from the Jerusalem Post, or at least the Jerusalem Post is reporting that Israel actually hit an Iranian Air Force assets at Isfahan. Now, we don't, again, know the extent of the dam damage or what exactly they were going after. But why is Iran playing down what happened? It, you know, Tina, is it something that could be dismissed or is it that they just don't want to be seen as vulnerable? I mean, I, I think they don't want to be seen as vulnerable. Again, we've got a, a weak regime, Iran being subject to, you know, to protests for a very long time now, an aging regime. 
Um, and uh, now they're in the midst of this very tense situation. They, they I, I don't think they'll reveal the extent of the damage, but I think there's a lot more that we need to look at than just the sort of attack and, and counterattack, right? I mean, I think, as I said, that this is a warning shot. I think that Israel may yet strike again. I think it's too early to say that the, the matter is concluded, but also um, Israel is likely to now resume its operations in earnest in, in the West Bank, sorry, in Gaza, in Gaza, that were uh, the, you know, the subject of so much international condemnation. And when it comes to the market response, there are other things that are happening mm -hmm. that are likely to, to keep inflation high and oil prices high that I think we have to look at the whole ecosystem of the geopolitical risk that's um, coming to the fore right now. And Mark, a lot of people are saying, look, what we heard know so far about this reported attack is that it was only really designed to show the might, capability and credibility of Israeli deterrence. Who are you watching next? So we haven't really heard from Iranian allies or, or, you know, other countries in the region. Are they likely to mention what happened? Or are they waiting for, for, you know, more news or will we hear nothing? Well, I mean... The important reaction is the Iranian response. Uh, uh, as far, you know, from reports, it, it seems that the Israelis also struck air defenses in Syria. Uh, so there is an element there. Uh, but, uh, you know, by and large at the moment, the Syrians are likely to follow Iran's cue uh, on, on whatever, you know, how to, how to react to this, whether to try and push it further. Uh, the Syrians also have limited, um, you know, capabilities to push it further without Iran's support. Uh, so I, I do think the Iranian response is the most important thing. Uh, amongst the Gulf states, Oman has issued a statement uh, which basically uh, condemns uh, the Israeli attack uh, and says, you know, we need a ceasefire in Gaza. So going to Tina's point, um, she's absolutely right. I think that, uh, you know, if this does now uh, conclude this uh, tit for tat between Israel and Iran, and that is an open question. We don't know if Israel will continue, um, but uh, if it does conclude, uh, you know, nothing's changed in Gaza. Uh, Netanyahu has made it very clear he still intends to go into Rafah, uh, and that will uh, just refocus international attention there. I mean, there, there are also reports, according to the Syrian state-run Sana news agency, uh, which is naming uh, Tina, an unnamed military source, that actually Israel struck uh, some of Syria's aerial d defense positions in the southern region, uh, which resulted in, in material damage. So does, if Syria gets more sucked in, who, who else mm -hmm. comes after it? Well, the, the risk of a regional conflagration remains remains elevated, and I think that for for your viewers, this is this is a really important point. The story isn't over. I, I'd add that um, the U.S. is also uh, getting um, pressure from the UAE and Saudi, saying they want the same kind of uh, air missile defense shield that Israel has, particularly if they're going to be expected to be part of some kind of de facto regional alliance. Um, and so the pressure on the U.S. to remain highly engaged from a security perspective in the Middle East is only going to increase. Uh, Tina, you're very good at trying to understand, of course, the market implications of all of this. I was surprised to see oil elevated, gaining 4 percent, but now only gaining 1 percent. Why is the market discounting at this point further escalation? We, uh, we've been talking about this for a while, haven't we? You know, the market still sees all news as, as good news. The fact that this wasn't a, a massive attack um, it has given a lot of comfort. We still see U.S. Treasury yields steepening. We still see an oil price premium. And I really think we have to bring it all together and say we are really not in an environment where the Fed is looking like it's going to do one or two rate cuts, given the inflationary pressures of this constellation of conflicts. You know, I've warned of a spring offensive uh, between Russia and Ukraine. The U.S. has just canceled um, the um, the Venezuela um, sort of a truce on sanctions. All of this together means means more pressure. So it's not in the you know the day to day moves so much um, as uh, a collection of factors uh, where geopolitics is increasing the risk premium. 
Um, the International Atomic Energy Agency confirmed there was no damage at nuclear sites. So this is an important thing that we have to continue to remind our viewers. But, Tina, what happens next in the oil market? So now it's all about supply. Is there a worry that, for example, the Houthi rebels attack ships and, and that without a direct attack, which frankly would have been crazy because it, it, you know, it would hurt the, the economy so much, but without a direct attack um, on oil facilities, we could still see very severe disruptions from the region on oil. Of course, because what, what we've had most recently is a breakout from the proxy war, the long-standing proxy war between Israel and Iran, fought out through uh, Iran's proxies, Hezbollah and the Houthi rebels. I see no reason why they won't continue their efforts to inflict damage on Israel, particularly if Israel goes in hard again on um, a Gaza offensive, um, right? So nothing has really changed in the geostrategic calculus between Israel and Iran, still bitter enemies. This is like dialing up, you know, the volume and, and dialing it back down again. But the fact that this taboo has been yep. broken on both sides suggests that this button could be pressed again. Mark, what do you think Vladimir Putin is thinking right now? I think Tina says, you know, th these are very uncertain times, especially from now until the U.S. election, because various countries could, could try and act nefariously without fear of real repercussion. Well, I mean, from his point of view, I think any uh, uh, kind of, you know, instability elsewhere that engages the U.S., that forces the U.S., um, you know, uh, to use its interceptors, for example, to bring up, um, you know, Iranian missiles down, uh, you know, it will have had to use a lot of interceptors uh, on Saturday. Um, those are in huge demand, uh, you know, and apart from that, you know, sort of more important kind of uh, political uh, aspect, this all distracts attention concern um, and capacity uh, to to deal with Ukraine. Uh, so I, I think uh, for, yeah. for Putin, this kind of event in the Middle East is, uh, is, is a benefit. All right. Thank you both for really some terrific insights. Tina Fordham, founder of Fordham Global Foresight and Mark Champion from Bloomberg Opinion. Now coming up, there's never a dull moment, also in crypto with more volatility this morning on the geopolitical tension ahead of the halving event, which comes every four years. Now we discuss what crypto traders are pricing in. That's next. And this is Bloomberg. Now, the German Chancellor Olaf Scholz says he's sending a third Patriot air defense system to Ukraine and more should from other EU member states. He was speaking to reporters after an informal meeting of EU leaders in Brussels. Now, with G7 foreign minister of meetings today, Berlin is pushing for stronger support for Kiev. Let's get more from Bloomberg's Oliver Kirk in Berlin. So, Oli, Ukraine's defense situation is deteriorating. Uh, we also, of course, have these escalating tensions in the Middle East. So what are European leaders bringing to the table? Right, Francine. I think that they know that there are certain limitations that they have in terms of their influence both on Iran and on, uh, Israel within the Middle East. So I think that for them, they see that their energy and their efforts are probably better spent dealing with the question of Ukraine. And even there, they're having some trouble getting additional aid to Ukraine, right? Schultz says that he'll add, uh, send another Patriot defense system. He says that speaking to the other leaders of Europe, that they're going to get another six in total by the end of the week. But Ukraine has been warning that obviously they've been running low on ammunition. They really need air defense because there's a lot more targeting by the Russians of some of their uh, internal infrastructure, including power. And really, I think that this frustration among many of the European leaders, particularly those close to the Russian border, was sort of embodied by Donald Tusk, who went out on Twitter um, at the beginning of the meeting saying that if all the words that were said here in the last years in Brussels about common defense could be changed into bullets and rocket launchers, Europe would have become the strongest power in the world and the safest place, which is really echoing some of the things that we've heard of from some of the defense CEOs I spoke to in Brussels earlier this week saying that, listen, if you want a new paradigm for European defense, you really need to boost these orders and we need to get that order flow in in order to get the capacity to where it needs to be. 
Add to that the G7 foreign ministers meeting in Capri right now. But for the Ukrainians and for Vladimir Putin, they're not looking at Brussels. They're not looking at Capri. They're looking at Washington, D.C., where this now it seems that Mike Johnson, leader of the House, will bring that vote to the House floor after six months of sort of delay by some of the disagreements within the Republican Party. That could finally bring that $61 billion package of aid desperately needed by the Ukrainians to them as early as this weekend when the vote goes through, potentially. Ollie, thanks so much. Oliver Crook there with very latest, of course, from the EU. Now, Bitcoin also solidly in the green after earlier falling on tensions in the Middle East. Volatility is overshadowing uh, the Bitcoin, having expected later today that will curb new supply of the token. Let's bring Bloomberg's crypto reporter, Emily Nicole. Emily, I mean, how's Bitcoin trading this morning? I mean, yeah, it's as you said, right? It's been very up and down along with other global risk assets. You know, Bitcoin pretty much trades within that barometer now, despite having had a stellar year last year and a pretty good start to 2024. Um, so what we're kind of expecting as the, as the day goes on is a little bit of that kind of haphazardness. It's been a very uncertain period of time for Bitcoin, whether it'll be up or down when the halving occurs, but that's yet to be seen. So, um, Nicole, it's also you know, expected to, go, to undergo this major change soon. I mean, the halving is a huge deal. Can you explain it for people less familiar with it and, and why it matters? So once every four years or so, a change happens in the Bitcoin network that makes it much harder to mine new tokens because there's only a cap, there's a cap supply, right? So there's only so many that could ever be in existence. Um, and what that does is it reduces the reward that miners get when they create new tokens in half, making the mining industry a lot more difficult for them as well. Um, that generally, so far in the past, has preceded a big upswing in Bitcoin's price. Not necessarily immediately, but you know, over the 12-month over period, you might see Bitcoin go up a lot. At the time of the last halving, Bitcoin was around 10,000, and look where it's at now, around 60,000 marks. So it definitely can can have that impact. But it's up in the air as to not whether or not that happened this year. It's, it's a very different environment now. And, and so are we expecting any major shift in prices once it's over? Well, if you talk to analysts at places like JP Morgan or Deutsche Bank, you know, they cover Bitcoin now. They probably didn't cover it back in 2020. <laughs> they certainly didn't. Um, <laughs> they think that a lot of this is already priced in. We've had a lot of big run-up for Bitcoin already because of the ECFs yeah. in the US. So whether or not that'll happen again is, is definitely uncertain. Emily, thank you so much, as always, for a terrific briefing. Emily, Nicole, with the very latest on Bitcoin. Coming up, risk sentiment improves on reports that Iran has no plans to retaliate after a strike by Israel. We'll bring you the latest market moves next, and this is Bloomberg. Rick's sentiment has improved after an escalation in tensions in the Middle East. Now, haven assets have paired gains, but risks still linger. Now, for more on all of this, we're joined by Julian Lee, our Bloomberg oil strategist, and, of course, Simon Kennedy, our senior executive editor for Macro Markets. There's a lot going on. I mean, this, Simon, is after a pretty dismal week, actually, for equities, because we've already seen the, the, you know, uh, the central bank divergence, and it kind of just adds to more volatility. Absolutely, and, the, and those... Uh that divergence uh, in central banks when it comes to things like bonds, it's, it's creating a real cross-current for markets in that you see geopolitical headlines and you want to buy bonds uh, and you see inflation headlines and you want to sell them. And so this is a real uh, source of tension uh, this week and going forward. Yeah, I mean, it was quite incredible. And I want to get some analysis from, from Julian in terms of oil price. But, it, you know, the, the real, I don't even know if it was panic, but the real kind of repricing of assets today it was pretty short-lived. Yeah, so you respond to the headline that, yeah. you know, talks about what's going on in uh, between Iran and Israel and then uh and then you're, you're moving quite quickly to, well, what does this mean next? And, and you saw that last weekend. Um, you know, Iran uh, hits Israel last weekend, and the, the kind of the initial gut reaction on Sunday was probably, oh, this is going to be bad for markets. But then you're into talks of, uh, is there going to be a, a cycle of retaliation? Uh, um, and so perhaps some of the, um, uh, some of the moves uh, that we saw initially overnight uh, were that, oh, is this what we worried about last weekend? And then perhaps a, a rethinking, uh, and, and you've certainly seen a bit more calmness uh, in, into Europe. Uh, Julian, how worried are you about the oil price? So we saw, again, concerns about possible Israeli strikes on oil facilities were dismissed or really never uh, a, an option that was priced in. But if the Houthi rebels start impacting shipments, that could see a big spike for the price of oil. Well, yes. I mean, I, you know, I think that throughout all of this, and, and you can 
you know, you can argue this has been the case since the Russian invasion of Ukraine in, in early 2022. We've seen all this rising geopolitical tension, both in Russia, Ukraine and in the Middle East and, and uh, in, you know, in and around the Southern Red Sea. Um, but none of that, for, for all the, the disruptions that we have seen, none of that has affected a single barrel of oil production. Um, and so that oil is getting onto the market just as it was before. Yes, it's taking a bit longer to get to uh, Europe from the Middle East than, than it does traditionally, but it's, it's still arriving. The only production that we've lost in, in two years has been about 100,000 barrels a day um, from South Sudan because of a pipeline rupture uh, north of its border in Sudan that its engineers can't get to because of the civil war there. So for all the geopolitical tension that we've seen, there, there's been a relatively limited impact on, on prices because production hasn't yeah. been affected. And I think that is going to persist and, unless there is uh, an attack that, that actually knocks out production or the ability to uh, ship oil out of a producing country uh, somewhere in the Middle East. And that yeah. doesn't appear uh, to be on the cards at the moment. But Julian, so if geopolitical tensions escalate, how big of a buffer do we have for oil? I know the IEA is expecting you know, supply um, to, or at least demand actually, to be hit somewhat. And then Saudi could also put extra barrels on the market if needed. Yeah, I mean, that, that's absolutely true. I mean, there is certainly, given all of the, the output restraint that we've had, uh, led by Saudi Arabia, but, but also coming from other um, big uh, Arab producers in the Middle East, there is a, a, a lot of spare capacity within uh, those countries at the moment that could, uh, should they decide it's necessary, uh, be utilized to make up for any shortfalls that might um, come from uh, perhaps um, uh, toughening up on, on the policing of sanctions on Iran, perhaps uh, any impact on, on uh, the absolute level of flows of oil out of Venezuela, given the the snapback of sanctions there. So there is spare capacity, um, and that does provide mm -hmm. the market with some comfort. As yeah. long as uh, people believe that Saudi Arabia and others will be willing to use that capacity. Um, Simon, interesting, you know, the havens are the same, but actually they're behaving a little bit differently. And we also look at dollar still bullish. Absolutely, and the dollar the dollar's on a real tear. And actually, um, someone's pointed out on MLive this morning that all those trades that you began the year with are all faded. This idea that this would be the dollar, the year to the, for the decline of the dollar. Um, bond yields continue to rise. Um, you'd have thought they'd be down by now, given that the Fed was supposed to be cutting. So, yes, yeah, so certainly the havens are, uh, are reacting differently. Uh, the yen, a, a typical haven as well, um, not, not perhaps seeing uh, as much there. So it's certainly a confusing... Uh, uh, outlook when you when you take the headline and you try and plug it into markets it's not ne those those easy trades are not necessarily there anymore yeah and, and gold and gold's you know going through I guess a little bit of a different behavior than it has in the past we saw a record high like two weeks ago and this is also treasury play absolutely and so the, the you know gold's been continuing grinding higher and some you know, MLive again speculating this week that you know when, a, when gold goes keeps going higher it starts to uh, create currency crises and uh, um, perhaps a bit of a, a kind of a inflated headline there, but perhaps at the same time, uh, against the backdrop of these IMF meetings going on, that you see these uh, um, uh, policymakers in Washington, Gorgieva yesterday talking about uh, treading that line carefully of, 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 of saying the Fed's doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. At the same time, when you look at Biden's industrial policies, when you look at interest rates much higher than you thought they were going to be, there are um, uh, kind of fallout effects elsewhere. The Koreans, um, the Japanese, all, uh, all feeling a bit stressed. OK, thank you both for joining us. Simon Kennedy, they're in charge of our market news, and Julian Lee, strategist for oil. Bloomberg Brief is up next, and this is Bloomberg.